It is great to see all of your faces this morning. I'm usually in the early service, so I don't get to see you very much, which is wonderful to be here now. Uh, we are going to read Psalm chapter 1, and then we'll jump into a prayer and get started this morning. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff with which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous." For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's bow. Dear Heavenly God, we thank you for this day, a day we get to gather in your house and sing praises to you, God. A day we are able to gather together and care for one another and hear what your word says. God, may you impress on our hearts righteous paths. May you show us that the ways of the wicked do not prosper. Or may we, out of care for our neighbor, instruct them in likewise, God, that righteous deeds stand and last. God, may we be people who built the house of our lives on the rock, on a firm foundation found in you, God. May you make us wise and shrewd, loving and caring, and may we praise and worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
people said amen. 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 Thank you this morning for your attendance, for your presence in worship, and also for your participation in worship. Thank you, musicians and song leaders and singers, and thank you for the scripture this morning. Thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to come before you. If you have your Bibles, if you have them today, if you'll turn with me to Matthew 16, we're going to be reading there in just a moment. Before we do, I'd like to read a card and express thanks on behalf of Donna Walker, who about two weeks ago, or almost now, was scheduled to have a routine uh, planned sc- surgery on a uh, particular issue, but uh, the day of that, uh, some other things went wrong. She had an emergency gallbladder surgery, but the Lord saw her through that. And she sent a card uh, today she wanted to read to the church with warmest thanks, grateful hearts, and deep appreciation for your thoughtfulness. I wasn't expecting to need urgent prayer, but it was very comforting to know when I suddenly needed emergency surgery, you were lifting up my name to our Heavenly Father. His hands were definitely on me during surgery and recovery. I'm thankful for my church family. Love, Donna Walker. And so we're continuing to pray for her recuperation, but she is doing very well. She was here this morning. Many of you saw her, and we are just rejoicing with her uh, that she didn't know she needed that surgery. Uh, God knew. And so a lot of things that we don't know, all those things God knows. If you were in Sunday school this morning, then you heard very uh, plainly stated Jeremiah chapter 1 that God knows what we need, that God has our days ordered and he is sovereign and he will help us. And so we're just praising the Lord for his help in her life and many others. We've had a very active prayer list for months and months and months. It's always that way every year, but during this pandemic, it's been exceptionally active, and and sometimes we just forget to stop and say, wow, God has answered a lot of prayers. He's healed many, many people, and we need to be uh, exuberant, and we need to not cease to give him praise, and we heard great testimony even last week. Sister Cheryl gave a great testimony at the end of our service, just giving God praise for his ability and his willingness uh, to intervene in our situations, and so we say praise the Lord today for all of his work in our church and in our lives together. Uh, One of the things we saw God do just this past Wednesday, we were together in worship on Wednesday night, and Todd and Kim Smith were here from Zambia, and they shared Kim in this room with the ladies and Todd in the other room, in the other building with the men, and uh, we didn't really announce we were taking up an offering. Many of you know that we traditionally do that, and we just trusted the Lord without telling you ahead of time. Uh, We did take up a love offering. And 1400 and some odd dollars, praise God, was uh, raised. $1,458. Let's give God praise for that. An offering uh, on a Wednesday night to the glory of God. And you heard how those kinds of gifts in the past, uh, we had raised money through our gifts and through our VBS over the last couple of years to do a water well. God used a water well to turn into two water wells and a third which was dug but was, was not able to find water. But even that's a praise and then that's a... You know, an X mark, something they don't have to worry about. That's not possible there, but somewhere else in the future, there will be water. And so even for God's nose, we say amen. And for roofs that were put on churches and bicycles that have been shipped and goats that have been given to widow ladies and poor families and chickens and all kind of stuff that you have done, we got to hear about it and got to realize that it's real again and, and get to be excited about what God's doing. So I just say praise the Lord for Todd and Kim and the messages they brought and the encouragement they bring us as we remind ourselves, as we did through Christmas season, that missionaries are real people. The mission is a real mission, and God is really honoring those who give and go and pray and participate in every way possible. So thank you for all that you always do, and God is doing a great job of being God. We just need to be us, okay, and, and let him use us in his will. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're in Matthew chapter 16. We're preaching about 2020 hindsight. Some things we need to look ahead for. Sometimes we look backwards to make sure we learn and to make sure we haven't uh, set ourselves up to repeat continual failures of the past. And 2020 uh, has some failure in it. And I think if we look back, we'll see that none of the failure is God's. Any of the failure was ours. We don't want to repeat it in 2021. And some of that failure is us demanding of God things that God does not have to do expecting of God to do things that God does not have to do, and in doing that, wasting the opportunities for us to do what we do 
have to do. We have an opportunity. It's now. It's not last year. It's not next year. The opportunity is now. So with 2020 hindsight, I'm going to ask you a question today. Where is your sign? Where is your sign? So let's stand to our feet. We're going to honor God as we read his word. Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he should show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them, and he departed. Let us pray. Lord, we pray today that we would hear your word and it would resonate in our heart. God, we know it is your will that none perish but all come to know you. We pray that someone will be saved today here in the parking lot at home. For salvation to come in the life of individuals is our prayer. We believe in agreement with your will. For your church to leave here unapologetic today, declaring the sign of Jonah to be the sign that we need, to seek and insist on no other sign, to call out those who are wasting today, seeking such signs, and calling men and women, boys and girls, to respond to the opportunity of today, salvation in Jesus, raised and alive, our victorious Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. Many years ago now, Jeff Foxworthy made the phrase popular, or no, not Jeff Foxworthy, his uh, companion. Here's your sign. What was that guy's name? Bill Ingvall, I think, was that guy, the comedian who would talk about what it means to be kind of country ignorant, you know, doing crazy things. And Can we admit that you don't have to be country to be ignorant? We don't have to be American to be wrong. We don't have to... Uh, be born in the 1900s or 2000s to, to be ridiculous in our approach to life. There have been a lot of ridiculous people throughout time. Can we say amen to that? Our title today is, Where is Your Sign? Sign of being receptive to Jesus Christ, being a, a participant in God's plan. The world is looking for signs all the time. Some in 2020 see the whole year as a sign or a symbol of something, some, something we need to interpret or in, interpolate and say, well, this uh, means something else. And, and maybe it's about more than sickness or disease. Well, can I tell you, we don't have to make things quite as complicated as many people make it. There were some people who came to Jesus in chapter 16, Pharisees and Sadducees. These were religious people, they were culturally right people, they were in the know, they were in the proper group to receive Jesus. Just one chapter earlier, we found a Gentile later, lady who came to Jesus, and he said, well, you're not the group of now, but these were the group of now. These were the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the religious, traditional, cultural people who should have been looking for Jesus, should have been knowing who he was, should have been in the right place to identify and properly interpret all the signs. Jesus had fed 5,000, and Jesus has fed now 4,000, and Jesus has healed people of demon possession and blindness and, and the maimed and, and all those in between. Jesus has performed many miracles, and yet still, these guys show up and say, can you show us a sign? I want to challenge you today, don't miss your sign while looking for another sign. Don't miss your sign while looking for another sign. Uh, I'll tread on thin ice today and talk about driving down the road with your spouse as your co-pilot. Can I just do that for a minute? Can I wade into that treacherous territory? Some of the 
near most cataclysmic arguments of my marriage have been in a car while trying to navigate. <laughs> One particularly harrowing moment in Pennsylvania, before GPS, when there were like real big maps. I didn't know if I was going to die in a car wreck or of fighting with my wife. We weren't fighting, honestly, but we, I think we almost had a car wreck. We were not in agreement on where we were or where we should have been or which way was north on the map. I don't even think we agreed on that at that moment. One of the things that happens routinely in the car when I'm with my wife is, is I'll just get to talking or thinking or daydreaming or something, and Jess, am I preaching to you? Brenda seems to think I am, okay? So, Jess, it's just me and you, nobody else. When we drive down the road, we are talking, we are thinking, we are daydreaming, and, and sometimes I don't remember what the last speed limit was. And I'm not sure my wife knows either, but she's pretty sure I'm going more than it, Okay? And, and so what do you inevitably begin to do? Well, what, what is the speed limit? You think about what the last sign was, but then there's another reaction. I start looking ahead like I want to see what the next sign is. And can I tell you, if you're one mile ahead, and if you had that good an eyesight, which we don't, but if you could see one mile ahead and see what the next speed limit is coming, and you get stopped where you are going a different speed than what the one was behind you, you can't tell the law enforcement officer, but the next speed limit is 102. You can't tell them that. Well, the last one was 15, sir. So that's where you are now. I know that seems trivial or silly, but as we think about it this morning, I think a lot of people are straining ahead to, to say, what's coming? What's the next sign? And what we need to understand is the sign we need is the sign we've been given. And I'll go a step further. Scripturally, there's not another sign coming that you have to have to find what you need to get. And so a lot of people, a lot of Christians even, are straining forward across the dashboard of life looking for some other sign that is to come, or people who say they're Christians, when in fact the sign they need is the sign they just passed and yet they're not paying attention to what it is. So preacher, what are you talking about? Well, we see it right here in this passage of scripture. These smart guys, religious guys, culturally right guys show up and they, they begin to talk to Jesus and they do, number one, what a lot of people do. Many people attempt to test Jesus. Here's, Here's how to know with some hindsight, you're, you're not really serious about the last sign you were given. You're wanting to give Jesus a test. I mean, you could play a quiz game about speed limits and about merging left or right or about how to properly orient a map. I mean, you can have all sorts of conversations while you're in your drive through life, but you're going to miss the point. People routinely came to Jesus and they wanted to play quiz game with him. They wanted to ask him things. They wanted to give him a test. But can I tell you, we're not going to get to heaven one day and people, I'm going to go to heaven one day and I'm going to ask Jesus, blah, blah, blah. Can I just tell you, if you've got a list of 40 questions, you're going to ask Jesus when you get to heaven, can I be so mean to you today to say maybe you're not going to heaven? <laughs> well, I'll get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jesus, blah, 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 blah. If we look back in hindsight, what we can find out is the people that had all these things they wanted to ask Jesus, most of them weren't going to heaven. Jesus is not our student. We are not his professor. We do not get to give him a quiz or an exam. Yet many people always have felt like they can go to Jesus and Perazo is what the Greek word says. Give him a test. Scrutinize him. Examine him. Some translations say tempt him. Can I ask you to look back on 2020? Maybe on the first half of the first month of 2021 and ask yourself, was I trying to tempt Jesus? 
Was I giving Jesus a test? Was I continuing to ask him to jump my steps and cross my hurdles and prove himself to me day and day and day and day after day? And I believe the answer for many people is yes. Jesus, you have to do this for me. Jesus, you must do this for me. And listen, Jesus does not have to, Jesus must not do anything for you. If you miss Sunday school today, go back to Jeremiah 1 and see that God told Jeremiah and tells us that we were formed in his mind before we were born. Jesus was not formed in our mind before he was born. Jesus was is, and forever will be, the I am, the one who is self-existent. He does not need us. We need him. Many people seek to test Jesus. Many people are seeking another sign from him. You must do one more thing to prove yourself to me. So, oh, that's not me, preacher. I'm not seeking another sign from Jesus. Really? Many people have. Throughout time, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, you see people doing this over and over and over again. We mentioned last week that many of the miracles in Matthew and the stories of the miracles are very similar to one another. So much so that on Sunday night last, uh, we were together and and one of our very faithful members in our prayer time, we were talking and I said, we're going to be preaching on Jesus feeding the 4,000. He said, well, you just preached on that a few weeks ago. I said, no, that was Jesus feeding the 5,000. And he looked at me and said, He did it twice? I said, yeah, he did it twice, just back to back. It's right there in the Bible. And it's not a mistake because later on in chapter 16, he's going to talk about the fact that he did it twice. Jesus has done a lot of things a whole lot of times. And he can do it again. We preached that last week. But listen, if he does it again, it's not because we deserve it. It's not because we demand it of him. It's because he's God and he does what he wants to do. But many people are seeking another sign from Jesus. And again, with 20-20 hindsight, look backwards and ask yourself, am I demanding that God keep doing things for me? In order for him to be God in my life, in my mind, do I keep thinking he has to do what I tell him to? By the way, that's not a God you're serving That's a genie in a bottle. That's a lottery lever you're trying to pull at your convenience, a cash machine, a microwave. You're trying to go through life manipulating and mechanizing God, and that's not who he is, and that's not how he works. And by the way, one way we know when we're doing that, seeking another sign from him, is do all the things that you expect to see God do, miraculously especially, serve as positive additional proofs of his power? So what do you mean by that, preacher? I've pointed out through the years, and I will point out to you today, that we know we are in the wrong when everything we expect God to do miraculously has to fit in a category of our life which is always positive and always additive to us. What do you mean? Well, now, God, if you're God, I need a raise. Well, I got a raise. But, you know, I was working real hard. God, if you're really God, not just a raise, but a bonus, okay, a bonus, and well, but God, not just a raise and a bonus, but, but now maybe give me a car to drive at work. And by the way, if you've been given any of that, that's awesome for you. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what makes God God. Now, an example of what I mean on the contrary is just look at how God showed himself in signs to prophets and of prophets in the times past. Go all the way back to the Old Testament in the book of Genesis and Exodus. In Exodus, as we have the story of Moses and being called of God to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, the people of Israel were in bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh. Y'all nod if you know the story. You with me? Okay. Moses was sent by God and told to go there. And, and early on in the story, God says, I want to give you some signs because, you know, God shows up and said, hey, I need all of your wealth, which is basically what you're asking for when they were asking for all these slaves. Well, hey, let me have all the resources of these people and come with me. So, so what did God tell Moses to do? He said, well, Moses, he said, I'm going to give you some signs. And, and these signs are not, if you'll notice, what I would call positive signs. He said, you're going to be able to take a, a rod and you're going to throw it down. It's going to turn to a snake. Now, we read that and we tell, tell preschoolers about it. And he threw it down his rod and it turned to a snake. Woo, isn't that fun? It's like, what would y'all do if I had a rod and threw it down and turned to a snake? 
<laughs> oh, yeah, it would be people jumping pews is what we'd have in here today. All of a sudden, that little Bible story for kids doesn't seem like it was so beneficial and additive, does it? No, somebody's going to get a heart attack. And what we know is the magicians, they threw theirs down and it seemed to turn into snakes, but his snake could gobble up their snake. I mean, what'd you do at church today? Man, we saw a snake gobble up another snake. Woo, that's good stuff. No, I want to find a church giving away $100 bills. I don't want a snake fight in church. The Bible also says that God told Moses he'd be able to take his hand, put it inside his garment, pull it out, and have Bitcoin and million dollars on it. Is that what it was? What was it? Leprosy. Some of y'all know the Bible. <laughs> now, everybody's looking for the church where they can go and be healed of leprosy, but nobody's looking for the church where the prophet can get leprosy. <laughs> The Bible also says that he could go and he could dip water out of, the, out of the river and pour it out and it would turn to diamonds. Is that the way the story goes? Anybody know the story? It turned to blood. <laughs> of course, you know later on there were 10 plagues, not 10 benefits. Hey, I'm going to prove to you how godly I am. We're going to give you 10 increasingly large benefits for the kingdom of Egypt to show that God is really God because we really need you on our team. Is that how that whole story unfolds? No, he's God. He showed through Moses that he is capable of doing awesome signs that are not positive in their outcome for the individuals they fall on. Nobody wants bit by a snake. Nobody wants to have leprosy. Nobody wants their water turned to blood. Nobody wants flies and frogs and all this stuff and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Nobody wants any of that stuff. When we talk about a divine, powerful, awesome God, he's sending us million-dollar bonuses all the time. Listen, that's not what the Bible says about the signs of God and his power. And to give you some 2020 hindsight and looking backwards over where we are, you need to ask yourself, is your version of a God who's powerful in a pandemic a God who only does the positive? I don't know about you, but many people are seeking another sign, positive sign only. Nobody is seeking negative signs from God. But let me tell you, God does give negative signs. Jesus gives clear direction from heaven, number three, and he does it through a certain kind of sign, and he tells us what it is, and it's the sign of Jonah. Verse four, no sign shall be given to this generation except it is the sign of the prophet Jonah. You say, all right, there's another one of those cute little stories that we tell kids when they're little. We even make up songs about it. We sang one to our daughter. Big fish, big fish, big fish, big fish, big fish. Oh, Joe, 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 Jonah. Anybody else sing that song? Did y'all know that song? Big fish swallowed Jonah. Well, that's just right out of the Bible, preacher. There's nothing wrong with that. There's not anything wrong with that. But we sure do sanitize that story, do we not? If, you, if any of you want to turn to Jonah, I'm going to read just a little bit of it, not the whole thing. I could read the whole thing because it's only four chapters, but I won't. It's in the back of the Old Testament. It's almost in the New Testament. It's so close in most of your Bibles geographically in the pages. Jonah's there, four chapters. We tell this to little kids in Sunday school, and many of them come away thinking Jonah is a great missionary, and Jonah stinks as a missionary. With a capital S and a capital T and a capital I and a capital N and a capital K and a capital S, he stinks. Or in the King James, he stanketh. Preacher, you're being kind of hard on Jonah. Well, I'm going to ask you in just a minute if you agree with me. The Bible says clearly in chapter 1 that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish for the presence of the Lord. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was an ungodly place full of ungodly people who had no religion. They had religion. It was ungodly religion. Didn't have the right religion. Didn't have the right culture. Didn't have the right know-how. They weren't at all like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, you see. They weren't like them at all. They didn't have anything going for them. And so Jonah didn't want to go to them. Do you know that a lot of people only want to go to the ones they think have something going for them? 
Jonah didn't want to go there. He went the other way. He bought a fare, but paid a ticket, got on a boat, went the other way. And the Bible says the Lord sent out a great wind to the, of the sea, and it was mighty, and the ship was about to be broken up. And these sailors who were on the ship were nervous. They were upset. They're like, this is not good. Now, now, if if I'm in a boat and you get off on the boat launch and you get out of the no-wake zone, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I'm not really comfortable with this. That's not what was going on. <laughs> there were some waves blowing. This was unlike any storm they'd been through, and it wasn't a storm they thought they would live through, and they knew that God or something was behind it, and they started questioning a lot of things. And Jonah is asleep. I love the book of Jonah. I love the language. And by the way, in a lot of secular schools, in literature, people will study the book of Jonah as a great piece of literature. Even people who don't believe in God say, man, this is a great piece of literature. He went down, 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 away from Nineveh, and then in a little bit he's going to go down, 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 the belly of the well. It's just a lot of imagery. Oh, sleeper, arise. That's what they say in verse 6. What do you mean, sleeper, arise? Call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. They they knew something about this guy. They knew something about his religion. Maybe, not, maybe they could just tell because of his garment and his tassel and all those kind of things. Maybe this was one of the ones who could do something about it. We're going to cast lots, they say in verse 7. Please tell us whose who's cause is this trouble in verse 8. In verse 9, he says, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the land and the sea. It's me. <laughs> It's my fault. What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? He said, pick me up and throw me in. Verse 12. Well, they didn't want to do that. These guys didn't want to murder anybody. Verse 14, so they pray about it. We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. God, this is your plan, kind of a negative kind of plan. Don't you agree? (laughs) We're going to throw this guy away. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. They found revival through a negative, what would man, that's an awful negative thing. Had to get rid of Jonah, but it saved their life. We just can't believe we'd ever have to get rid of anything to save our lives, do we? American Christianity is all additive. What, what can we add to make it better? We can just add to get better and get better. Let's just add some more stuff. Let's make some more commitments. Let's do some more stuff. Let's have more things and we'll be better. Listen, what if God called us to get rid of some stuff? Now the Lord prepared a great fish and swallowed Jonah. I think we have to, I'm going to use a little bit of biblical imagination. I believe these old boys saw Jonah get swallowed up. There goes Jonah, there goes a great fish. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Powerful poem, chapter two, a whole chapter, down, down, down. He's in the well, he's in the belly, the ribs are like bars, and, and he's in there, and there's, I mean, he threw three days in the belly of the well. Listen, think about that. I ain't never been in the belly of the well. I don't want to be. I think it stinks in the belly of the well. Remember what I told you? Jonah was a prophet who stunk. I mean, I just believe the Bible's literal. I believe he's literally in a fish's belly. I believe there was really gastrointestinal fluid inside of there. In just a little while, we're going to see a miraculous expulsion, otherwise known as vomit. I liked it the other way, preacher, better. Verse 10, so the Lord spoke to fish. Some of y'all won't like it unless it's in the Bible. And it vomited Jonah onto dry land. We don't say that word. Well, it's just the Bible. Jonah was a prophet who stunk. Literally, he stunk. Many commentators believe his skin was probably bleached from the acid in that beast. Clothes stained if he had any on. Now, we preach this like that part never really happened, and he just goes and starts preaching, they have a revival. Have you ever wondered why these people believe this man? Would it get your attention if God vomited a preacher into your presence? I believe he did this morning. I think you're it. He stunk. He had all the signs of being dead. 
I kind of half believe, somewhere in my little creative preacher mind, that the sailors might have beat him back to shore. It took him three days to get there. Man, this guy, and he bought a ticket, and he's on the boat, and he was supposed to be headed here, but he didn't want to go here. And I'm telling you, word, I mean, rumors spread like wildfire. We threw him in. The fish gobbled him up. No, oh, no, he ain't gobbled. He's right there. He's here. You should have seen it. There it was. Should have smelled it. Woo, there he is. Some of y'all never thought about it. Some of you wish you hadn't thought about it now. God's will didn't change for Jonah. Chapter 3, arise, go to Nineveh, to that great city, and preach the message that I gave you. God's message does not change in any environment, no matter how positive or additive we continue to try to say that God has to be, have to add to us, have to bless us, have to heal us. God doesn't have to do anything more for us because he's given us the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah rose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in extent. It took him three days to get there. It took him three days to get across it. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. God's going to get you. Now that's a revival message. You won't be able to fill up a coliseum with that, will you? Who's going to respond to that? So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the least to the greatest, or the greatest to the least. The word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes and proclaimed and published a decree. Let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mildly to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and resist and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? God saw their works, that they turned from their evil ways. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And we live in a nation and are among a people who believe that if revival came, we would see it in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. If revival came, that we think we would see it in political polls. If revival came, we think we'd see it because we'd be great as a nation. And what the Bible shows us is that when God sends revival, it's seen not in the greatness of the people of the nation, but in the humility that they show before a mighty and a holy God. Because we see and we can smell the stench of judgment as it comes. And death as it has been treated and overcome by the prophet. Now we know that Jonah was a forerunner and Jonah was imperfect in every way. But the Bible says that Jesus proclaims that I come and I give you a final sign and it's the sign of Jonah. And that Jesus lived without sin. And he died in your place and my place for our sin. And he was placed in a tomb. And he was there until the third day. And he rose again in victory. And these people believed a prophet who'd been dead and was alive. And these people today must believe in the sign of the prophet, the true and the living God. Hebrews, go and read it. Jesus, better than every other prophet, better than every other preacher, better than every other priest that's ever been, better than every other sacrifice that could ever be. Jesus, one time fully forever, entered into the depths of hell, conquered death, hell, and the grave, rose and was given freedom and liberty. He didn't give, take, they didn't take his life, he gave it. He took back his life, he picked it up again, and he said, I am alive and I am here. And those who receive the preaching of that prophet, the sign of Jonah in Jesus, dead, buried, rose again, victorious, preaching not simply judgment, but grace and freedom. See, Jonah didn't even preach grace. He just preached judgment. Jesus comes and said, I come that you might have life and have it 
more abundantly. I come that your sin can be covered. And though you are dark in your sin and trespasses, you can be made whole, washed white as snow. Jesus comes and offers us a greater hope than anything Jonah ever preached. The question is, are we going to receive what Jesus did as the sign of the prophet Jonah? That he lived, he died, he rose again. See, people are, oh my, I guess Jonah was a great preacher. No, people just saw in Jonah one who died and came forward from death and preached with the power of God. Jesus said, some of y'all don't believe me. Jesus said, some of y'all seen me multiply fish and you didn't believe it. You've seen me multiply fish again, you don't believe it. you see me heal people and you don't believe it. He said, but the final thing I'm going to do, the most impressive, most victorious, most complete thing that I will do is I will die on the cross for your sin and I will be raised to life on the third day. And that is my fullest, most final, miraculous thing that I could ever do for you and that's going to be your opportunity. And there's not going to be another. That's going to be it. That's going to be complete. Jesus is not obligated to give us any other offers <laughs> or additional signs. Well, I don't like that one. I, I want another one. Well, you're not getting another one. That's what it says in verse 4 of Matthew 16. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after another sign. I want to ask you, are you asking God to do it one more time? God, I need you to do one more thing. <laughs> I'm not asking you, are you asking God for a miracle? That's not my question. My question is, are you asking God to prove himself to you one more time? Because no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus gives the ability to every one of us to recognize and respond to him. So I, I don't know. I, I think I, I need him to do one more miraculous thing. No, Jesus gives us the ability. He gives it to you, gives it to me. That's, that's what he shows us in verses 2 and 3. He, he pointed out to the scribes and Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, you even know how to tell the weather. You can look at the sky in the evening, you know what the weather's going to be that night. You can look at the sky in the morning, you can tell what the weather's going to be all day long. You're pretty smart people. Turn to the person you're next to and say, wake up, you're pretty smart, okay? You're pretty smart. You have ability. You have intellect and know-how, <laughs> You can figure some things out. Everybody's got different abilities, different kinds of intellect, and those different kinds of things. But all of you have something you can do. And Jesus says to these guys, hey, you're, you're pretty smart. And if you can figure this out, what you need to know is this is enough. Because some of you are going to say, well, now, you know, he gave the fish to those people, and he gave this healing to these people, and, that, and he's got to give something to me because i got to have mine. Listen, no, what he's saying is everybody has been given what they need. There's enough opportunity in your life that if you look at the sinless life, the atoning death, and the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have enough to make your decision. See, we're always believing by faith, yes, but there is evidence. There's an empty tomb. There's a risen Savior. There are testimonies. There is the work of the church throughout time. There's the word of God preached. There's the worship of God experienced. There's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you right now. He doesn't owe you anything else. His greatest sign has been given to each and every one of us. And he gives you the ability. He gives me the ability to recognize and respond to him. Well, but preacher, I, I'm trying. I, I'm trying. Listen, I'm almost done. Many people continue to fake their interest in finding a home in heaven. A lot of people say they're trying. Trying to figure it out. If, I, if he'd do just one more thing, prove, me, prove himself one more time, then I'd have what I need. Many people are faking it. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're, they're faking this whole thing. Fair weather, foul weather. Can we figure it out? Jesus says, hey, you're not serious. If you were serious, you could figure it out. Can I tell you that today? If you were serious, you'll figure it out. If you're truly asking God, he'll truly respond to you. Truly seeking him, he'll let you find him. Verse 3, Jesus tells these Pharisees and Sadducees that they're hypocrites. I am preacher. You talked about vomit. Now you're talking about hypocrites. You're just kind of getting it all in there today. This is, this is rough. 
Man, you'd think if you just preached the red-letter parts of the Bible, you'd just have a whole lot of fuzzy and warm feelings when you leave church, wouldn't you? Not really. This is just what Jesus said. He just looked at these men. He said, you're a hypocrite. Because you do know how to tell the weather. And you really could determine whether or not I'm the Savior of the world. You'd have to care about it as much. I'm, I'm glad we live in a nation and a world where we can figure out things scientifically. I was reading an article the other day that, that said, I don't have it in front of me, but I could probably dig it up or find it. I don't want to argue about it. Somewhere within the first week or so of scientists releasing the DNA chain sequence of COVID, blah, 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 whatever the technical name of it was, like within the first week, microbiologists, scientists, chemists, they had figured out the vaccine that quick, like within a week. Man, that's pretty impressive. And I'm not, I mean, that's impressive to me. I'm like, wow, <laughs> we can know a lot. That took a whole another nine months or so to produce it and get it out and all this stuff. But man, we live in a pretty intellectual world. We can figure out a lot of stuff. We can do it real quickly. But within a few days of a pandemic, we can figure out the X's and O's and numerical answer to the medical part of it. But a year later, what we realize is we don't have it figured out at all. We can get serious about things and and we can figure it out. God's given us an intellect, the the image of God is impressed into humanity. There's great creative ability and, and great insight. But, but what if we step back and said, well, what if we really thought about for a whole week life, eternity? I, mean, I don't know the scientists that figured that out, but what I know is I've run across so many people in the United States and in Calhoun and in Georgia or Redbud You'd think some of y'all were the ones trying to figure it all out. <laughs> Man, we've turned into experts. What if we put that much effort and time and focus on saying, Jesus, are you Lord? Are you my Savior? So I think it's time for us to ask the question, are we being serious with God? Are you being serious with Jesus today? And I, I, again, I'm not being flippant about disease. I'm so glad that there are people who are scientifically minded who are serious. And man, and when they get serious about it, they can figure out a lot of stuff medically, scientifically, mathematically. They can do that. Chemically, they can do it. But that's not the answer to what's ill in the world. The question is, are all of us going to say, Lord, what's our biggest problem? Looking backwards in 2020, what was the biggest problem we faced? Can we just be honest enough and say it was us and our own sin? In 2021, it's the same thing. Lord, what do we need more than anything to fix that? Can we have enough faith to exercise today to say, Lord, we need to accept you as the final prophet and the final sign and the forever resurrected one who came from death to preach life, to preach victory, to bring resurrection power. And Lord, to be honest enough to say if we reject you, we know that we are choosing wickedness and adulterousness, adultery. We're choosing judgment for ourselves. Lord, can we, we can be birthed in the clean new robes of the resurrection of Jesus, or we can go through life stinking in our old sin. But the reality is we've got to get serious. Jesus said, some of you are like a hypocrite, one who wears a mask, one who plays a part in the theater. You can put on a smile, you can put on a frown, you can just be real sad. And you know when to do which one, you know what's appropriate, but listen, Jesus knows what's behind the mask. And he knows the real you. And he knows whether or not you have received him in resurrection power. The question is, are you going to be honest with him today? The biggest thing in your life in 2020 is still the biggest thing in your life in 2021, and it's not a pandemic. 
It's endemic in each one of us. It's sin. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and stand to your feet. We're going to have a time of invitation. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we can be saved through your grace. God, we thank you that you tell us we can come to you and know you, be forgiven of sin, be adopted into a new family, being given an eternal life. Lord, we ask you right now for one or many who are lost to come to kneel on this altar and to ask you for forgiveness to admit to you that they are sinners, to agree with you what you already know about them, that they've fallen short, to want from you what you want to give them, which is forgiveness, adoption, eternal life, believing that you will give it, and calling upon you for salvation, committing their life into your hands. Lord, someone needs to do that right now, even while we pray. God, we thank you for this day of worship. We thank you for your grace. In your love, in Jesus' name we ask this prayer. Amen. As we sing, you be obedient. These altar areas are open to you right now for you to come, to kneel before the Lord, to ask him into your heart. Maybe you know you're a Christian, but you need to come and you need to ask Jesus to give you a clear witness and a clear call in the life of others so they not go through life flippantly, hypocritically, thinking it doesn't matter because they're seeing you live such a common life. That God would make you a clear witness of his resurrection power in everyone's life that he puts you in front of. Let's sing and let's be obedient. This is your call to come right now as we sing. All God's people said amen. It's been a blessing to be in the Lord's house today with you. Uh, thank you for being here. I want to encourage you to be back in the Lord's house tonight. At 5 o'clock we have prayer time in the uh, what we call the Old Fellowship Hall. It's just a large room behind the baptistry area there. And at 6 o'clock we have our evening worship. We'd like to invite each one of you to come and be a part of that. Saturday is a great opportunity for Go Ministries. And if you've never done that, then do it. If you've done it before, then we need your help doing it. We always need... Somewhere around a dozen or more people. That really helps uh, divide up the effort and to give us more time. Uh, we have fewer people. It ends up like being a mail route where you just, or a paper route where you just kind of throwing the food at every door and behind by. We've got plenty of help. You can really stop and talk and build a relationship with people 
who are hurting, some of them lonely, all of them appreciative of uh, you being there. And so the more of us, the merrier, truly it is, and the easier it is to really get into ministry and not just get into administrating food. So come at 930, we'll make the food. That doesn't take very long. It's just hot dog lunches. And then by 1030 or 11, we're normally at the location and giving the food away normally takes about an hour. We're always through before noon. And uh, so you come and be a part of that and spend your Saturday in ministry. Just meet us in the fellowship hall at 930 on Saturday. We'd love to have you. Uh, remember this whole month, really, we're emphasizing and thinking about uh, sanctity of life this month, and generally we would do a change for the baby's offering. Uh, we're not doing change. There's a change shortage for one, and banking is kind of weird and going in and out, and so sorting coins. We're just asking you this year, make your best gift, okay? You can make it in any way, put in an envelope, put in an offering plate, or just designate on a check. It's for the Calhoun Pregnancy Center, and we're not trying to minimize it. We want to maximize it. We believe it would just be easier to administrate this year if you'll give paper money in some way, either cash or a check, and uh, you can make it payable to the church, and then we'll get one check uh, to the Calhoun Pregnancy Center. Just put on the four line, four line for the Pregnancy Center or put change for the babies or whatever on the four line. We'll get it there. Uh, we'll do that all month long, and we believe God honors that. God's always honored your gifts in that way. Um, do we have any other announcements that I'm forgetting? If we are, and you don't tell me, it'll be your fault too, okay? It is great to be in the Lord's house. Uh, just a praise, a lot of great things are going on, and one of them is attendance, and I know that attendance is really hard to track. If you're online, thank you. If you're in the parking lot, thank you. What we know is in the building has been growing a little bit, and thank you for being here, but also thank you for respecting one another and obey obeying social distancing. But in Sunday school last week, which is a combination of online and in the building, we had 130-something in Sunday school last week, which was a record over the last year. It's been the best we've done since the pandemic has been going on, so we're excited about that. Today, I think, was another good day in Sunday school. Some have not yet met. If you don't have a Sunday school class, we will help you find one. And you say, I feel comfortable in worship, but I don't want to be in a small group in a room. Look, we will help you find an online uh, Bible study group to be a part of. There's no shame either way you want to choose that. The only shame would be saying, I don't want to choose that. I don't want to be in Bible study. So we'll help you find one either on campus or online. If you need help, let us know. We can't help you find one if you don't ask. So let us know. We'll help you find Bible study opportunities. Be here on Wednesday. There's another Bible study opportunity. The ladies meet in here. The guys meet in the back. Okay. Turn around, wave at somebody. You can wave at the camera if you want to, and then let uh, Sister Selena help you get out. Uh, one at a time in an orderly fashion. Give them the Holy Spirit.